Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. This is episode 877. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is August 27th, 2024. All right, welcome to another program of Anglican Unscripted. This is where Kevin and George sit in front of our webcams and talk about politics, Christianity, and anything we find fun or frivolous, like the weather. Uh, I've turned off the AC here in Sasquatch, so I will not uh, have noise in the background, which is good for you guys, the listeners. We appreciate you uh, being patient with all the technical issues we have. George uh, has fixed his camera issue from last week, which is good. Uh, he's been going back and forth between his iPhone and camera. And um, we had a new problem this week as far as technology. And George is no longer using high-speed cable internet. I don't know why. <laughs> oh, we have our tech fellow at church is in his 80s. And he mm. used to own a Radio Shack. And of nice. course... When you have volunteers running different aspects of your church, you get the people who think they know everything. And he found a deal moving from wired internet via Spectrum to Wi-Fi via Verizon. And so we're now on 4G. We have gone backwards, Kevin, in technology. <laughs> and uh, uh, we are basically now using Radio Shack technology uh, mm -hmm. for uh, our broadcasts and until the next vestry meeting when I'll recommend that, well, we move to another user. Yeah, that's all right. So if you see George again go fuzzy and out of focus, it's not his mind, it's the camera we've been dealing with here in the pre-show. We'll see if we can, we can move beyond that. I want to welcome everybody. Before we get too far into the show, this is the point where you like it before you don't like it. You, you, you like this episode on Facebook and YouTube. Don't do that after the show because you may not like it. Uh, if you don't share this uh, episode with family, friends, or foe, now's a great time to do that. The comment section. Oh, my Lord. 120 comments in our last uh, episode. We really appreciate it. We read them all. We don't answer them all because some are trolls. That's, that's not a big deal, though. We just appreciate that you're here. And what else do you normally have you do? Oh, like it. No, it's ever Subscribe if you haven't subscribed. George, how are you doing this week? I'm doing great. Uh, this coming month, uh, this past weekend, I did my first weekend training for the forthcoming Kairos weekend. That's the prison ministry weekend where we go in from a Thursday to a Sunday to minister uh, almost one on one. We're in table groups uh, with inmates at the uh, local state prison. It's a lot of preparation, a lot of work, uh, but it's great fun. September 1st, this Sunday, we start our confirmation classes for adults uh, for the coming once every three year visit by the bishop. So we're going to actually cut the grass and make sure the books balance. And so when the bishop comes, everything looks great. And then we can go back to normal and back, back to sleep. Normal, yeah. <laughs> Cool. So it's a, it's a, even though it's the dog days of summer and most <laughs> things are slow and uh, down here in Florida because of the heat and uh, the tourists are gone, we're all working busy away trying to get ready for the upcoming fall. Yeah. Uh, Jill and I are in Maryland for a little while and uh, I've been attending Christ Church in Aki, Akuki. I, I, I'm not really good at the pronunciation uh, over uh, just north of here. It's been a, a wonderful time. And uh, uh, I am staying in a Department of Defense Naval Campground. Never done that before. And I have an official pass because I passed the DOD background check. And uh, when, I, when I pull up to the guard check, it's not just a little gate that raises up. It's a guy with an AK-47, a sidearm, a bulletproof vest, and fatigues on. And he's you know, in his 20s. He's probably 6'5", uh, 250. And uh, I think he, he, he could get a better job than guarding the campground. But, you know, it, it's a fun job. I, I, I don't digress too much. George, we've got a lot of news to cover today. Uh, we are going to start with the Free Church of England, who, if you haven't watched the last two episodes of Anglican Unscripted, shame on you. But uh, they fired uh, Reverend Brett Murphy. And there's been a little bit of pushback to that. Uh, Reverend Brett Murphy is also a YouTuber, like ourselves, and has a bit of a following. So let's talk about the attacks going on with Brett Murphy right now. 
Yeah, this story is not going away. The fire is burning brighter and brighter and hotter and hotter. Uh, I've been made aware of a whisper, or I would call it a slander campaign against Brett Murphy. People have contacted me in good faith saying, I've been told in confidence that Brett Murphy went to a dodgy seminary, that his ordination is questionable and his background is suspect. Well, friends, Brett was ordained by the Archbishop of Melbourne. Now, you may think that's yeah, dodgy yeah, yeah, in hey. Australia. Okay. Little dodgy. <laughs> and, he, and he was educated at Ridley Seminary, which is the theological college down yeah. in Melbourne. Yeah. So all of this whisper, whisper, whisper about his background and this, that being questionable is untrue. The next little thing is, you remember Brett Murphy a year ago left the Church of England and was subject to disciplinary complaints because he called a transgender archdeacon a witch, I think it was. It may have been another woman. I, I thought, or yeah, I thought he called her a man, but whatever. Uh, he, call, he called Rachel Mann. Yeah. I don't know what man, a man, when Rachel yeah. Mann is a man. Yes. And he's somebody in, in some sort of exchange, he called somebody a witch who really is a witch. They don't actually believe. They follow, you know, mystical practices that are not in line with the gospel. And he was found not guilty by uh, the, the court of uh, inquiry in the Church of England. Well, a year goes by, and now it's being thrown at it up against him that he's bringing the Ch Free Church of England in disrepute for this crap that took place a year ago. So the surrogates of Bishop Paul Fennick, uh, no, I'm sorry, Bishop uh, Fennick, whether directly or somebody, Bishop Fennick said, who will rid me of this meddlesome priest, troublesome priest, are trying to do so through slander and innuendo. Well, it's just unpleasant and unfortunate, and it's also untrue. Well, so, my problem yes, is... Yes, he has a solid background. Yes, he's a real ordination. Yeah. Yes, he's a real Christian priest and a believer. And uh, he's a husband and has children, and he's, he's a real person who probably doesn't deserve to deal with this type of persecution from the church. Now, my problem is when, when you're slandering and uh, doing this at the social media level or the uh, Anglican Inc. level, or you're trying to get us involved in it, what's happening behind the scenes? I would assume by now the REC and other people have called Bishop Fenwick to say, what's going on here? And I would hope Bishop Fenwick would not respond with uh, gossip, rumors, and lies. I would assume that he's on the up and up with response here. Because if I were the REC, I would, you know, as a, a companion uh, sister diocese to uh, the Free Church of England, I would want to know what's going on because it kind of sullies you as well. So I, I would hope that they're getting the truth yeah, as well. And, and, the, and the issue is there's no real accountability for Bishop Fennec. They have diocesan synod, the Northern Diocese of the Free Church of England in October. And if uh, the, the, those who would raise questions about Bishop Fennec have either been driven out or uh, not invited to synod. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a, a priest who uh, of the Free Church of England who brought canonical charges against Bishop Fennec uh, for misconduct akin to the misconduct uh, that is being alleged now of bullying and intimidation and uh, abuse of uh, canonical law and process. And Bishop Fennec uh, basically excommunicated him. And because he was excommunicated, the whole charges were dropped. So that's a good way to get rid of your uh, legal problems is if the, you know, the, you know, it, it's like the mafia rubbing out uh, the witness in the shooting, you know, <laughs> hey, no witnesses, no crime. No. So, there's there will be no accountability from the institutions of the Free Church of England because of the the bishop's uh, uh, actions. Now, the Free Church of England's bishops, uh, Bishop Fenwick and Bishop Hunt, have a dodgy past in the sense that there have been questions raised about financial misconduct. Uh, when Middlesbrough was sold, the parish there, um, a, an investigation was done. Where did the money go? And I've been given a letter from the police fraud squad saying, asking Bishop Hunt, why is the money in your 
personal accounts and not in the church accounts. Well, that was resolved by moving the money to where it should be. But there have been allegations and suggestions that have not uh, panned out into criminal charges, but there's a fear that the bishops are feathering their own nest, that they're liquidating assets to care for themselves. Now, whether it's true or not, I have no way of knowing. But the difficulty for the Free Church of England is this is the perception. And the perception is that your leaders are dishonest. Now, this is the thing that the Free Church, that the Reformed Episcopal Church needs to step into because they are tied, married, if you will, to somebody who has a reputation for being a crook. And what can be done about it? Now, Ray Sutton can't do anything legally, but if Ray Sutton, you know, has a private word, uh, Ray Sutton, the head of the REC, saying, clean up your act, get your act together, I think that'll go a long way. I would say um, Bishop Ray Sutton. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, and, and that's, that's true because, you know, we live in this reality where people over here in America and in England uh, are seeing what's happening and they we believe in accountability we believe in resolution we don't just believe in uh having this continue in the press for four six eight months and it, you know a nice uh, uh call from bishop ray sutton maybe a public letter explain what's going on would help a lot so and here's the situation on the ground uh this past sunday services were held uh brett murphy's gone he's been fired he can't you know He's not on site. Mm -hmm. And the wardens were there at the front door and waiting, and Bishop uh, Fennec came. And the warden said, we don't want you to come. We have filed a police complaint against you for intimidation, and here's the the incident number and everything. And we think it's unwise if you force your way into the church while you're being investigated for intimidating us criminally. And Bishop Fennec said, oh, well, that's been resolved, and pushed his way past the wardens. And then went inside and basically stayed a few minutes and then left. He wanted not to sort of worship the Lord, but to prove his point that he had the right to go in and out whenever he wanted to. So the church is not really, it's no longer a church in the sense of a house of God where worship and uh, is held it's an asset that is being fought over and the congregation wants Brett back they want to worship the Lord uh, Bishop Fennec wants his authority uh, to be followed absolutely with no questions and they're incompatible at this point so what will probably happen is that the congregation will be scattered and uh, Bishop Fennec will have uh, an old building to sell and the assets used hopefully will go into the FCE accounts not, not somebody's private account and we'll be we'll be all set well the uh, Free Church of England had posted on their Facebook group that there would be an announcement for coming or more news about what's happening I've not seen anything since they, they posted <clears> that <throat> uh, I don't know <clears throat> if they the, the uh, uh, secretary has the week off, or this you know is on holiday. But I, I would you know try and respond to some of these allegations. Uh, this is not going to go away anytime soon. Ah, all right, George, this is a big one. Next story. Uh, you have accused Anglican Inc. of being double-sided, being a you know. I have. Uh, I, yes, have. You have. I have. Yes, you have. So, and we we're talking about this in the pre-show. He goes, Kevin, I think we pick on Canterbury more than we pick on other uh, uh, Church of England churches or ca- uh, cathedrals. And I said, really, what's your point? George? Well, last week, I, I, I feel guilty. And I maybe it's because my mother made me this way, but I feel guilty about a lot of stuff. Uh, Last week, we took Canterbury Cathedral and its dean to task for having a disco uh, 80s night at the cathedral. You know, Pet Shop Boys, Depeche Mode, <laughs> Kylie yep. Minogue, all that stuff. Uh. You know, the little, little uh, glitter balls and whatnot. And essentially, we said this was vulgar and profane. Um, now, the uh, Bishop of uh, Chichester has since uh, come out with uh, guidelines 
about how churches can be used for secular purposes, which would forbid any church in the Diocese of Chichester, Martin Warner's the bishop, he's a, he's a society bishop, from doing anything like what Canterbury Cathedral did, has to be in good taste, it has to follow the, uh, you know, what is done must not profane the Lord or anything like that. So you can't have, uh, you know, uh, Frankie goes to Hollywood, have, yeah, things yeah. like that. You, you yes. can have the sound of music, but you can't. Well, uh -huh. but now I see I get uh, I get a lot of emails, and I got an invitation from Eventbrite, which is that marketing company sure. for events, uh -huh. to go to a Taylor Swift evening of music at All Souls Langham Place. All Souls Langham Place is John Stott's old church. It's the it's the evangelical powerhouse church that just recently was the location of the commissioning of overseers for Church of England clergy who cannot follow their bishops down the road to perdition. Now, is it because God loves Taylor Swift and hates the Pet Shop Boys that uh, this is permissible? Or am I being, should I pick on All Souls Langham Place or should I apologize to Canterbury? How should I? Oh, how no, can hey, I square this, Kevin? Let's back up because Christianity Today, Religious News Service, and many other uh, modern Christian periodicals have praised Taylor Swift and her message to young girls. And I think even evangelical. I have Harris. no clue what that message might be. I, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I have nothing. Uh, I have no knowledge whatsoever. And so, Tell me, it, Kevin. If, if some literal factions of the church are willing to say that Taylor Swift. Uh, is a, a good image uh, bearer for children. How could you and I uh, say otherwise, George? I mean, if, if I were invited to a Taylor Swift concert and given three tickets, I would take my two daughters and I would be the favorite dad forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Although I think my oldest has outgrown Taylor Swift. She's not really a Swifty. But my middle child would love it. But, you know, I don't know. Uh, what can we use churches for? Um, I think you, you run danger anytime you walk outside of worship. Uh, the, the church is there to gather the body of Christ, to encourage them, to teach them, and to worship. And I understand the desire. It's an empty building, you know, a couple days a week. Can't we use it for something else? I just, I, I just know what's in those lyrics of those songs from the 80s, and I can't uh, recommend that Frankie Goes to Hollywood is a appropriate song. Uh, music choice for uh, any Canterbury Cathedral. Uh, so let's move on. Do you know? Yeah? Well, do you know what really upset me, Kevin? Okay. It really upset me. I just saw a little thing come across my Facebook feed. Uh, Billy Idol just became a U.S. citizen. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> oh I my didn't goodness! Know. Uh, and you, you, the English are exporting everything awful to our country. Uh, yeah. Next, we'll get your Starmer entering the UK in the US, but uh, oh, I'm teasing. But uh, Billy Idol was another one of these people that you wouldn't want to have a Billy Idol contest. Uh, white Wedding Day sung. Good in church, day uh, for a white wedding. You come on. Morning, wedding, morning. Yes, wouldn't, wouldn't, yeah. wouldn't, yeah. <laughs> oh, and geez. now he's one of us and he gets to vote. Uh, the joke was it said he's a Trump voter. <laughs> so I would say he gets I, take I, it. I, I mean, what do you want? You know, um, he's on, he's on side. He, okay, he may still yeah. lose his hair. I'm sure he still loses his hair. Um, yes, I don't know but how, can he scowl the way he, he used scowl. to scowl? Er, I, don't. I don't. I look like a parrot when I try to do it. So, a oh. pirate, not a parrot. All right. So I, I lost my story page here. Going back here. Um, so we've been talking. Uh, on and off for the last three or four weeks about what's been going on in the UK as far as riots, reactions to the Ill illegal immigration, uh, people taking boats from uh, other countries and arriving on the shores and not really integrating well into the country, not uh, uh, to the point where it's, it's become safe. It's become commonplace, but not safe. And you have here the next story that the bishops have been silent on the civil rights abuses in the UK for the last month. Uh, the no justice, no peace crowd is silent in the face of evil, except for one bishop in the wilderness. One, Rachel. One bishop, uh, Rachel Trewick, who is mm -hmm. the bishop resp responsible for prisons in the Church of England, 
was on the Sunday program at the BBC, and she was saying that she didn't think there should be custodial sentences, meaning jail time, for young offenders arrested in the wake of the disturbances. So, like, there was an 18-year-old given a two-year sentence for making obscene gestures at a policeman and stuff like that. She thinks that uh, they should have community service. They shouldn't be in prison. Now, this is a good start. Now, she's not saying this about the 65-year-old man who takes care of his uh, crippled wife, who's now going to be jailed for 18 months for making offensive gestures at a police dog or something. They're not talking about the justice issue itself. It's talking about the sentencing of these people. So Rachel is staying within her lane about prisons. Once they're in the prison, now they should be treated. The reputation of the UK is in the United States right now it's piss poor. Oh, it's piss rough. poor. I mean, it is, um, you know, the threats against Elon Musk that he'd be arrested for his for Twitter, uh, the arrest, you know, the the total absence of free speech, the two tier policing. Now, the government denies it takes place. The Church of England denies there's two tier policing. They think that's offensive. Oh, we just saw what I'm waiting for the police to publish the photos of all the Notting Hill rioters or criminals who in the uh, uh, diverse neighborhood of Notting Hill have their annual carnival uh, rape and stabbing sprees and how quickly they'll be sentenced to prisons for long stretches. We all know it's not going to happen, huh? but, uh, you know, a fellow uh, gets off an airplane arrested for uh, after a vacation, getting arrested in front of his family and within a week is jailed for two years or so for for speech and thought crimes. Yeah, the, um, head, of, the head of Telegraph, I, uh, the app, is arrested. You know, now, we are only protected by a document here. There are actually Supreme Court justices serving right now who do not believe we have the we should have the freedom of speech that we do. I mean, uh, it, it is still tenuous over here. What you see in the UK can happen anywhere. Yet we always say, oh, the UK is a wonderful westernized democracy, um, and, and they'll do just fine. They've ha had some growing pains, of course, in the past. Uh, but no, it, it, you can lose your rights very quickly because all rights are up into, up into the interpretation of the government. And here the government mm -hmm. has not just misinterpreted their own laws, but misinterpreted European Union laws uh, in order to jail people who at this time in this, this threat environment have said things that uh, we as English government find distasteful and we have the right to um, prison you and have done so. Mm -hmm. it's, it's sad. I believe in America that could happen one day within a generation uh, because yep. uh, a, a document only protects you when the government protects the document. So. And see, see, the thing is the United States, we do not believe that the government is the source of rights. Mm -hmm. We believe the government is the protector of rights, but they do not give us these rights. We have these rights independent of the governor, government. These rights are inalienable, and they come from God. America was founded on Christian principles, and but not on denominational ones. Uh, so separation of church and state is not separation of God and Christian uh, ideals from the government. It's a separation from having a Church of England established. Um, you know, the Church of England was established in New York, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, the congregational churches were established in Congre in Massachusetts and uh, Connecticut before the revolution, meaning the state paid the salaries mm -hmm. of the, the clergy. And they, that was essentially the only permissible church. In fact, every, we state, don't have, we, every state constitution pre-Declaration um, uh, of Independence and, and pre-Constitution um, referred to their uh, representatives having to have a faith in uh, Christian God, except for Massachusetts, mm -hmm. of course, except for Massachusetts. Uh, so, you know, the, the history of uh, Christianity here in America is palatable up until a point. Well, yeah, and, you know, America's development as a nation has been founded on this sense that right and wrong is not 
a creation of the government. It's a creation of our moral reasoning as citizens, and we take that moral reasoning to the state. That's why we can have fights over abortion. That's why we have fight had a fought 150 years ago over slavery. We have a fight over these moral issues because we as adult individuals, you know, believe these rights are given to us not by the government says we can do it or can't do it, but because of what God or our conscience or whatever you want to call it has given to us. And in some respects, it's a messier process, but it's a lasting process. I can disagree profoundly with my neighbor on certain issues, but neither one of us has the ability to compel belief. And what we're seeing in Britain right now with the labor government and a thoroughly corrupted police force is the compulsion of groupthink and of what I would call I don't like this phrase because I don't, Kevin had to explain to me what it meant, but gaslighting. Don't believe the evidence of your eyes. Belie you know, I'm lying to you and you can, you know, I've just, Kevin, you've just handed me a rock and you're telling me it's a diamond. I say, Kevin, it's a rock. And you tell me, no, it's a diamond. A diamond. And that's shame gaslighting. On, shame on you for thinking it's a rock. Yeah, that's yeah. gaslighting. Mm -hmm. So shame on you for thinking that Rachel Mann is a man. Mm -hmm. That's a lie, the Church of England tells us. Shame on you for uh, thinking that there's a problem with the integration of people from the third world who do not share the cultural values and uh, toleration and democracy and things like that. Shame on you. And it's not happening. The only criminals out there are these white working class thugs who are protesting you know, that they have no future in their own country. No housing, no jobs, no pride in who they are. Um, England's in a really bad way, as is all of Europe. You know, as Kenshin mentioned, the arrest of the Kevin. Kev, Kevin mentioned the arrest of the Telegram uh, CEO in France. Mm -hmm. We've got this problem in Italy. Mm -hmm. We have all these stabbings in Germany, and the German justice minister says it. There, her first response is. We shouldn't blame foreigners for this problem. Well, the foreigners are doing all these things, but we shouldn't blame them. We should allow the culture enrichers to sort of make Germany a better place. Well, at this time, uh, I think the last study was 47% of the people on welfare are recent immigrants to Germany. These are people who come from places, you know, Afghanistan, Syria, this, that, and the other, with no intention of of assimilating, but just living off welfare state and having hardworking German taxpayers pay their way. Well, I, okay, I can do better. One, and I don't remember what police department it was in the UK, had a female uh, commissioner stand up and say, um, the riots are, uh, one of the causes is extreme misogyny. And we will persecute extreme misogyny. And this is a meme I've seen on Facebook. And I, really oh, is this the woman who looks like Jimmy Neutron with her hair so, standing yeah. straight up? Yeah, there you go. And you know, like I'm like six-inch forehead. I, I'm like, uh, yeah. let's go to the text. I I want to open the Quran, and no, I, I, what do you think is being taught in Islamic schools throughout the UK, bar none, except for extreme misogyny. Unless you find a, a liberal Islamic school, uh, so go ahead, persecute away. I, I dare you. But no, they're not going to do it because she was well, lying. And, and now the education uh, secretary is saying that, you know, we're going to teach that what to teach children about the problem of whiteness. You know, all, you know, the DEI crap that has almost ruined the U.S. military. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, we're getting it back. Yeah, um, has slowly. done so much to destroy Boeing and other great company. My God, how, you know, Boeing can't rescue its own people. Boeing on its homepage has announced that it has a record number of female engineers. Well, they can't get their own astronauts back. They've got to rely on Elon Musk, who hires on merit, not on sex or gender. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the... Britain is, is drinking the Kool-Aid. 
And the thing is, this is a government that is only supported by 20% of the people the ballot box, of all the people who could have voted. I, I wonder what's going to happen in the, the next election, you know? So, don't, you know. I don't it, know. I don't know either, because uh, will they go uh, Romania, 1980 or 1991? Or will they go just <laughs> election? So I don't know. Well, let's we'll see. It's sad. We'll report on it here because uh, a large portion of our audience is from the UK, and they love to correct us in the comments. Uh, please be gentle on us because we're just colonists over here in America. Story number four: Zelensky government allows the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, the Moscow Patriarchy. Um, I kind of we had discussions like this about a year ago. I said it was bound to happen, and it has happened. What's the result here? The Moscow, there are actually two or three Ukrainian Orthodox churches. Yeah. One has a patriarch in uh, Kiev who's recognized by the ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew in, in Istanbul. There's a third, sec, another smaller Ukrainian Orthodox Church, and then there's the Ukrainian Orthodox Church that's a division of the Russian Orthodox Church. This division, which is, uh, which is made up of Ukrainians, has been outlawed. And, and this is akin to the Episcopal Church's situation during the American Revolution. The, uh, for some people, the Episcopal Church, because we had a prayer book that uh, prayed for the king and we were established, made us traitors. Well, George, it was helped by George Washington and most a good number of the founding fathers being Episcopalian. And so we were never outlawed. But uh, the, the loyalists in America were predominantly Episcopalian. Well, what Zelensky do, has done is say that the those, even though they say they're patriotic Ukrainians, even though they uh, do not support uh, Vladimir Putin, but are under spiritual oversight of, uh, of Kirill, Zelensky says that's not enough. Your third columnist, uh, I'm sorry, fifth columnists, your potential traitors, this church is outlawed. And Francis, Pope Francis, has said, no, 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 you, can't, you shouldn't do that. You can't yeah. do that. This yeah. is... Con this is Europe. I mean, this is you cannot outlaw religious groups. Yeah, I mean, how if you're going to do that? What, hey, go ahead and just do internment camps. I mean, if you're going to segregate a section of people, religious or racial, um, you, you're making it more difficult for yourself. And I don't see internal uh, politics like this causing the problem they're having. I think uh, most of their problems are uh, just trying to fund the uh, defense, their defense. You know, uh, Zelensky's a crook, uh, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, he just there's bought, no question he, about that. Yeah, he just bought a house in Lagos Island. Lagos Island is the island between Miami Beach and Miami, and it's the most expensive, you know, real estate in Florida. I mean, these are tens of millions of dollars you know i think he's i think his house is next to the one of the former uh bgs uh the guy with the, the bad teeth the skinny one never mind okay so he's got fun neighbors but justin welby has been a Zelensky fanboy from way back justin's been there a few times he's talked about this as a war of right and wrong he plates this in starkest black and white colors Russians bad, Ukrainians good, Zelensky good, Putin bad. And now we have, yeah, no, no talk about the utter, you know, Zelensky's wife, I'm a car enthusiast, as many of you know, Zelensky's wife just took ownership of a Bugatti. The top of the line Bugatti, there, there's, 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 yeah, several different varieties. Yeah, there's several different varieties, but the one she got was uh, like 1.5 million US dollars. Kevin, you're my tax, uh, our, as taxpayers, our money is buying Bugattis for Zelensky's wife. Uh, Zelensky's wife. Mm -hmm. Now, Justin Welby, he's probably on the beach on a lounge chair next to uh, Joe Biden in Rehoboth Beach. You know, he is so quick to jump up and defend Ukraine and Zelensky. 
but he says nothing about corruption. He says nothing about religious oppression. Not that I'm surprised, but this is just totally in character with his total lack of integrity. What do you want yeah, to say? Yeah. I don't know. Maybe he's on holiday. That, that's a possibility. But I think one of the problems we have with Zelensky is he is the enemy to our enemy, and we will give him mm-hmm. whatever he needs. And he flies back here and gets eight billion dollar checks from the the U.S. government, and uh, that that's just insane. Um, now they're having some relative success. I, you were certain this would end last winter. I was certain it was going to end the winter before. Um, it's going and going and going. Uh, clearly, they have some method to the mythology, enemy to our enemy. But at some point, uh, we're going to run out of money. We're out of money. We don't have money to write $8 billion checks. Yeah. We're going to run out of money, and we're going to run out of Ukrainian men to fight. Yeah. Um, and at a certain point, there are no more houses for sale on the Gorse Island. Uh, there are only so many uh, places to take your money and hide it. Uh, maybe I, those places would be full. Yeah, I don't know. I And I don't know if Putin just thought that he had such an easy time in Crimea uh, that uh, Ukraine would be, you know, certainly a little harder. But I, I think Putin thought this was a, a one-month campaign tops. And we're going into well, my, m- multiple years. My my ill-informed uh, hunch is that everybody's just waiting for Donald Trump to come back into office. Yeah, and once Trump is in office, he'll broker some sort of deal that'll make everybody happy. Or as happy as they can be. In Art the of the deal. Art of the deal. All right. So let's move on here to the next story. <laughs> okay. Now, I, I, I need to admit my bias here. Because the next story involves, uh, we have a, a portion of people, a uh, large portion of people here who watch Anglican Scripted who are Roman Catholic. And I love you dearly. And understand that I'm Anglican in the 39 article sense of Anglican. And I have a different view of Mary, Mother of Jesus, than you do. And I think you can find the importance of Mary revealed in the New Testament, in the Old Testament. Okay, your importance as a character in the New Testament was revealed in the Old Testament. And she gets like maybe one or two verses in the Old Testament. Okay, and not, a, you know, there's just no, no prophets are talking about how she will be um, a glorified co whatever, whatever, whatever. And just that just, it's Kevin's understanding. This is what I see. So don't get mad at me when the Pope agrees with me. Don't do not do that. Mary, our sister, Pope Francis has, has ignited a firestorm amongst traditional Catholics, some of who watch the show, many of sh- who should watch the show, George. At the end, during the Angelus, which is his sermon, mm-hmm. on the Feast of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary on August 15th, Francis either inadvertently or deliberately set off a bomb, a bomb bigger than the Pachamama of stuff, um, bigger than who am I to decide about homosexuality, bigger than, well, you know, whatever. Pachamama is a big one, yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Francis, in describing Mary and all of her attributes and all of the blessings and this and that and her role, and for our Protestant viewers, the assumption is the dogma, meaning you must believe this to be a Catholic. Mary, when she died, her body was taken incorruptible into heaven, akin, I think, to Elijah in the whirlwind or Melchizedek, um, or our Lord with Jesus when he ascended into heaven. Now, that is not in scripture, but it is a tradition, and I'm not going to argue the merits back and forth of that. Needless to say, it is not something shared in the Anglican tradition, except in a few areas, except in a few Anglo-Catholic strongholds. Francis, in describing Mary's role, changed language. Uh, John Paul II was very famous for hinting that Mary was our co-redemptrix. Redemptrix is the female of Redeemer. 
and that Mary assists in our salvation. And there are some very traditional Catholic priests that say, without Mary, you're not going anywhere. Chad Rippinger, who is somebody I follow sure. because he's an exorcist yeah. and he has some re really interesting videos. He, he had a video recently that if Mary takes your eyes off you and her prayers for you, you're not going to paradise, I'm paraphrasing. Now, Francis, in describing Mary as, described her not as our mother, meaning she's the mother of all of us. And traditionally Catholics have taken that from the uh, passage in the gospel where Jesus is on the cross and he says to the beloved disciple John, uh, behold this, my this mother. mother. Yeah. And then he says uh, to Mary, behold thy son. And this has been theologically interpreted to mean that Mary is not just being placed in the care of John, but Mary is to act as the mother for all of us. John represents all of us. Protestant interpretation is that this is specific to this incident. Well, where are we going with this? Francis, in summing up, said that we need to follow Mary, our sister in the faith, leading the way, not our mother in the faith, not the mother of us all, but our sister in the faith, which is an Anglican, mainstream Anglican understanding. This caused a furore among traditionist, traditionist Catholic commentators. Some theologians hit back really hard and there have, and it spilled over into Facebook fights between Catholics and Protestants over the role of Mary. And France, it's this latest round of fights can all be laid to Francis choosing to call Mary our sister leading the way rather than the mother of us all. Well, let's think about the tenets of the Marian doctrine. Uh, Theotokos, is that, am I pronouncing that Theotico, right? Theotokos, Theotico, okay. yes. Okay, basically uh, Mary is the God bearer. I, I, and hold on, I'm not a, uh, I, I don't have the education here. You just, Kevin, you're wrong or right, right? Yes, I got that right, okay. Uh, yeah, you got it right, you got it right. Okay. All right, uh, Immaculate you Conception. It, you got it more than 99% of Episcopal priests know that. Okay, uh, Immaculate Conception. They know golfs. Yeah. <laughs> Immaculate Conception is another tenet of Mary Doctor. Uh, virginity um, forever, eternal, uh, perpetual virginity. Another doctrine. Mm -hmm. Now, Anglicans do believe some of this. We believe certainly in her virginity uh, at conception. Um, what's another one? Assumption of Mary. Uh, uh, that she was a, that. You know, there are four Marian dog, dogmas, and there okay. some Anglicans accept all four. Okay. Some accept one out of three that uh, Jesus was born of a virgin, mm -hmm. that the virgin yeah. birth. I cool. think every Anglican accepts the virgin birth. If they're a traditional Anglican, I'm sure there's some bishops, Jack Spawn, who doesn't believe in the virgin birth. Um, but the Anglicans will dispute that she was a perpetual virgin, and they will cite the passages, you know, Jesus, uh, Mary, and brothers. Jesus' brothers and sisters. Yeah, sisters, yeah, absolutely. You know, Catholics yeah. will say these are our first cousins, or Joseph, uh, Mary was his second wife, you know, we don't have any evidence for that. We just have the, the straightforward language. And Jesus's response to the crowd, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? They're those in faith. If Mary was such a special person who had a special role in the economy of salvation, Jesus certainly would have not used that language. Mm -hmm. Mary is absent in Paul's letters. Mary appears in the book of Acts only at the uh, uh, ascension. This is not in any way to diminish Mary's role. Uh, but rather to say that the over-the-top Mariology that some Catholics leading to that Mary has a role in our redemption um, is one of the stumbling blocks between reunion between Anglicans and Episcopalians. Yeah. To become a Roman Catholic, if, you wanted to jo if I were to join the Ordinariate, I would have to... Uh, believe in the four Marian dogmas. And I'm fortunately, I cannot because I cannot reconcile them with scripture and my tradition and human reason. Maybe that's, those are the tools we as Anglicans use. 
and and please hear me this is anglican unscripted don't get mad at us because we don't hold the tenets of mary doctrine um uh i i was a protestant before an anglican you know brought up in the congregational church we just we never had any um role for mary outside of scripture and if you want to offer a role for mary in the church outside of scripture i i i, I can't go there george i'm sorry yeah, yeah. the the uh, anglican the art anglican articles uh which some may just dismiss out of hand but you know one of the things they say is that what is not found in scripture must not be you cannot compel belief in something that is extra scriptural and so the assumption of mary and her immaculate conception is something not found in scripture so now you would say well it can be inferred and implied but no it's got to be pretty much clear that like jesus rose from the dead on the third day that you you can't fiddle that one now, and if you want to get mad at anybody, get mad at Francis. He started it, not yes. us. He's the one who calls Mary our sister, leading the way. Hey. Well, yeah. So, all right. Now, and this isn't just a Catholic, uh, a Roman Catholic, Anglican, Lutheran issue. This is also uh, the Orthodox uh, come down in the middle of this. Um, you know, it, it's it's something been discussed in the church since. Oh my. Councils of the Church have discussed this too. It's it's not Kevin and George discussing this for the first time in 2024. So uh, get mad at Francis, and uh, if you want to go to the comments, go to the comments. Understand you're commenting on Anglican unscripted. Let me pull out the show notes now, here. Yeah. Now, in de now in defenders of Francis, uh, yeah. one of the prayers for uh, the Assumption of Mary is a is a little homily from Saint Athanasius. And Athanasius uses the language that uh, Francis used, des describing Mary as our sister in the journey towards God. Mm -hmm. So maybe Francis just did a cut and paste of Athanasius and wasn't thinking clearly. I don't know. Who knows? So let's yeah, well, blame Athanasius and uh, Francis. Or age. You and I are getting old. We forget half the things we forget all day long. It's, you know, it happens. Number six story, ACNA priest elected Bishop of Madagascar, Daryl uh, Critch, a person I've met in the uh, ANIC, is to be Bishop of, oh no, Mahajana, Madagascar? Mahajanga. Uh, Mahajanga. Mahajanga. And replaces the English USPG missionary who's there. That's cool. This, this is cool, but it's also a big deal. Yeah. Uh, we've seen a Canterbury boy. USPG is very liberal. They drank the Kool-Aid long time ago. Yeah. Their bishop in Mahajanga is being replaced by an Acna priest. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, Daryl Critch is a uh, rector in Newfoundland. Uh, he's the archdeacon for Eastern Canada. He was ordained by Don Harvey, thoroughly Orthodox priest. And he's going to go from the frigid Newfoundland uh, to... Uh, Madagascar. <laughs> Southern Madagascar. Yeah. And it's going to be a little hot. And Mahajanga is probably one of the poorest of the poor dioceses. So this is a real missionary endeavor. So friends, if you get an appeal for support, support this fellow. Absolutely. Now from an, in from an inside Anglican baseball thing, this is major news. This is the Indian province of the Indian Ocean saying they have no province if that's justin tell him to get back to work they have no uh let me turn off the ringer they have no problem whatsoever with anglican orders anglican mm -hmm. acna anything the gradual supplanting of the church of england and the canterbury centered world by the wider GAFCON Global South world, we see an example of this. Daryl Critch met the people from Madagascar. Daryl has been a has done missionary work in Guatemala, but I don't think he's done missionary work in Madagascar. He met people, I think, at the Cairo Global South Conference, and the Malagasy bishops met him, and they hit it off, and they called him to be a missionary bishop there. This is a big deal. This is evidence yeah. again of the decline of the canterbury centric world hold on get my news page up here yeah it's interesting uh let's see we also have news of the youngest 
Anglican Gafka bishop elected. Nelson, who was elected, was 34 years old. I, I was still in diapers at 34. That's that's pretty young, George. Yeah. I don't think you can drink in Florida at 34, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but Nelson, and I'm going to pr- try to pronounce your name, Nelson. Nada Kevan. Nada Kevanjo. Nada Kevanjo. Nelson Dacavanjo yeah. was elected assistant or Suffragan bishop of the Reformed Episcopal, Reformed Evangelical Anglican Church of Namibia. That's the old Church of England in South Africa. That's their Namibian branch. He was elected as their Suffragan bishop last month. Uh, 34 years old, Kevin, my goodness. <laughs> We're so old. I feel old. We're I mean, so when old. I was th- when I was thirty four, I thought I was the cat's meow. I thought, you know, I'm smart. I'm wise. You know, I got the whole world is my oyster. So, but let's let's keep uh, Nelson in our prayers because uh, it's going to be a challenge uh, at thirty four. Uh, and then, oh boy, we're going to dice and we we're jumping around. We're going back to the UK here. Um, there's dumb diocesan of Derby Derby news. The same diocese where safeguarding black bald Bernard Randall, we've been talking about him for several weeks now, uh, for being orthodox, has a new scandal, George. Yeah, you gotta you gotta give credit to Bishop Libby Lane for being the dumbest bishop in the Church of England and not being able to exercise episcopal authority. On paper. She let a on paper she let a zealous safeguarding officer black ball bernard randall because bernard randall was an orthodox christian teaching church doctrine Mm -hmm. and the liberal nut job who does safeguarding said oh he's danger to kids now their net zero officer who is a greeny weeny fanatic has told a church in the peak district that they cannot replace their oil fired boilers the Peak District is, if you remember the TV show, All Creatures Great and Small, that sort of, you know, small towns, rural up in the hills and mountains. Well, it, it, the Cathedral of the Peak District, I forget its name, but the massive ancient church, their boilers broke down a year ago and the church wanted to get new boilers. Well, Church of England's General Synod has adopted these, you know, by 2050, we're going to be carbon zero. And therefore, the church net zero officer, Black, you know, refused permission to put in new oil or electric or gas fired boilers. You got to be solar. You have to be green. You have to have wind energy. Maybe they could put a nuclear reactor in, in the uh, in the undercroft. I don't know. But the, the net result has been they would rather have people freeze in the winter because the peak, net peak district is cold and damp. They would rather have people freeze and then instead uh, and have no carbon emissions. Um, now, I believe the whole net zero agenda is a fraud. I believe it's absolute nonsense. And it's, it's you know, just not, you know, it's... It's the latest in the experts being absolutely completely wrong from COVID to the war in Iraq to the war in Ukraine. The smart people telling us what's going to happen. Kevin, you know, how, you know, how long has it been since the polar, the polar caps should melt and the polar bears will all drown and Al Gore was going to be proven wrong? I don't know. This year, and you all talk about polar caps in the Arctic, which is north of here, not Antarctic, Arctic is north of here. They measured... This year, for some reason, it's been a mild year here. Uh, they've added twenty-two percent to the Arctic shelf up there in, in thickness and size. Now, is that being reported anywhere? Does somebody say, "Oh, we were wrong"? No, because uh, if if I'm a government scientist and I know my job to be a government scientist is to keep my job, I will report uh, in order to keep my job, and that means you still need me. And you still need me because the Arctic is melting, the sea is rising, uh, even though, and here's another report, uh, Savannah, beautiful town, is sinking. I thought the seas were going to rise and overtake it. No, it happens to be sinking. Uh, Louisiana, uh, um, New Orleans, Orleans, supposed to be overtaken by the waters. No, it's actually sinking. 
Yeah, and so. some of these stories we say about oh these islands in the Pacific and this and that are all going to be underwater soon. It's not happening. I don't know. The uh, you know the the seas are not rising. Now, now there may be local variations of it. Um, well, due to we we do need to let people know that yes, the air is more humid over the last hundred years. Uh, that mm-hmm. measurement it cannot be denied. We do have to admit that there's fluctuations in climate, and climate does change. That can't be denied. The climate has changed daily, hourly, since God said, let there be light. Because the most uh, influential item in our climate is the sun. It's, it, we, you know, I'm not an anti-climate person. I know climate is changing. I think human influence is waning in that respect. So much so that there if, this- we, if we implemented all the gas removal and solar and wind farms that they demand we do and spend $8 trillion doing it, we could o- they say that we could only lower it one the temperature one-tenth of one degree. Oh, then what's, where's our influence? Yeah, and, you know, the... There was a recent science story where uh, a cardiologist did a major study in the UK about using beta blockers before open heart surgery. And his conclusion was beta blockers would be helpful. Slow down, yeah. And this turned out to be he, it was a fraud. He had basically come to conclusion he was funded by the pharmaceutical industry and it was a scientific fraud. Further studies have now shown that beta blockers before heart surgery increase your risk of dying by 27%. Now, this, and, but here's the thing. His studies influenced NHS policy in the UK. So a lie was used to basically kill 27% more people than who would have died otherwise in mm-hmm. British heart surgery. Now we see this, you know, with the climate change stuff. You know, with the, you know, there's the lawsuits between Mark Stein, the uh, columnist, and the uh, he used to be at Penn State. I don't know where he is. Who the guy who came up with the hockey stick curve? Man, and, his last name. Yeah, yeah. And basically, Stein points out this is a total fraud uh, without scientific evidence. And uh, you know, I think we've reached the point where. If experts say something, I can find an expert who will say the opposite. It's whoever pays, as you say, Kevin, whoever pays the freight, pays for the freight, gets the result they want. Would the average person consider Kevin a conspiracy theorist? No, not really. However, in looking back in history and looking back at how uh, we have elevated science to religion, yeah, we, we have some problems here because... Uh, science done correctly is always correcting science. You're always rehypothesizing. Um, you always go back to the drawing board. That's how we get better medical advances. That's how we get better um, uh, power advances. The, the nuclear reactors we can make today is the, the size of a small building would power half a city like Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, they don't use the dangerous radiation that they used before. It's done completely different. Um, and we did that by reapplying what we knew and reapplying what we knew to make it better. And that's the, the role of science, is not to have settled science, but to have um, uh, uh, questioned science. So, uh, that's Kevin. So, yeah. so England is continuing its uh, self-directed suicide, the Church of England, you know, by... Mm-hmm freezing people out of churches, driving them away with false doctrines, celebrating the the destruction of the English nation as a people. Um, man, how long is this going to last? Okay. Not in the show notes. And I just remembered to do this. I need to make a correction from uh, an episode one or two weeks ago where I talked about the uh, Islamic student who raped a 13-year-old um, and... I had remember seeing the story on Facebook, and so all I did was type in 
uh, Islamic student, raped 13 year old UK, and boom, I got a link, and that link uh, described an incident and said his name was Sean Hogg. George, what are the chances that 13 years ago or seven years ago, two Islamic students from different schools raped a 13 year old? I it, so I just I went Sean. I didn't check for two. I didn't check for three or, or more. So the actual name of the the one I was referring to, and I want to thank a member of the audience for correcting me, is Aldil Rashid. Aldil Rashid is the one from 2013. Sean Hogg was uh, um, a uh, rapist uh, more more recently, and that's what happens in this day and age. I can't always be as precise as the audience wants. I had no idea it happened more than once. Maybe that's the problem. Kevin, you were okay. you were you were directionally correct. Yes. You know, it's like directions my mother would give me. You know, <laughs> we want to go north, but don't uh -huh. take I ten, take ninety five. Yes. Yeah. I mean, with that the extreme uh, misogyny being taught in the schools, uh, it was bound to happen more than once. Uh, shame on me for not knowing that, George. All right, last story. A friend of the show, somebody I got to interview, Miss uh, Isabel Von Spruce, has been awarded uh, monetary damages for being arrested by the UK police. Yay! Yeah. She received 13,000 pounds from the West Midlands police in acknowledgement of her unjust treatment and breach for human rights for her arrest for silently praying outside an abortion clinic. So the courts have uh, awarded damages for someone arrested for a thought crime, just as the police are now arresting people for thought crimes. Now, yeah. if this were the United States, she wouldn't have gotten 13,000 pounds. Oh. She would have got 1.3 million. 1.5, I mean, 13, 13,000, yeah. you know, you, 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 come on, England, come on, you know, let let. let let's get it let's, let's push this a little harder and stronger and try to get more money out of these things mm -hmm. and you know but this is what's going this is what's starting to happen with the transgender movement in the united states surgeons who did these surgeries on children without fully get forming them of everything of uh you know taking off their breasts or mutilating mutilating their genitalia without their having foreign consent are now starting to get hit by damage suits and the and the insurance companies are basically now no longer uh, willing to insure surgeons who are doing transgender surgeries. Now there are some hospitals well, the, where they cover the coverage is made, yeah. but if you had a if you were an individual and you wanted to do this surgery, and you, your insurance company who is insuring you for liability would say no. Yeah. So in some respects, it, the the system is working by potentially bankrupting the people who will do these evil things. Up to a point. I guarantee that there's a bill floating around uh, the state of California right now, New Jersey and other places, that will indemnify uh, surgeons who perform these tasks because the, the evil insurance uh, industry won't. And so that if a person who went to like ch to Texas Children's Hospital here, uh, did I blow myself way off camera by bumping here? Sorry. No, you're fine. You're fine. <laughs> whack the laptop. Uh, in, in the Daily Mail today, uh, there's a Christian nurse who uh, blew the whistle on Texas Children's Hospital, which is a children's hospital, uh, for allegedly using federal funds for gender-affirming care. Uh, she was fired. Her name is Vanessa Silvich. She's 31, and she is a Christian. She used to work in the uh, internautics, you know, area that's where they get the, the puberty blockers and this hospital denied ever providing surgeries or ever providing uh blockers and she said that's not true in fact you charge the federal government for that and uh under whistleblower status here in america you should not be fired for that but when you whistleblow against the liberal elites of our country you're gonna get fired and uh, uh, i hope she gets another but job somewhere you yeah. know She'll get another job somewhere. Plus, she'll get a massive payout because the Texas Children's Hospital violated Texas law, mm -hmm. and uh, Texas is, uh, you know, they're <laughs> rather conservative on this issue. Yeah, on, on some issues there, absolutely. Okay, George, audience, I'm sorry. It's one hour, four minutes. I apologize. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 877 
of Anglican Unscripted.